Let's get started. All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Verle Hevert, and I'm a professor of law at the LSE, and I'm also currently the associate dean of the law school. It's my great privilege to welcome you to the LSE for this discussion on plurality and the pursuit of knowledge. Now, in the spotlight this evening is the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act. As many of you will know, HAFSA was adopted as law in 2023 and intended to enter into effect in, well, slightly oversimplifying it, August 2024 and there around. Um, however, the government has now decided to halt its implementation and there is a lot of talk about repealing the act in uh, the very near future. Now, obviously we have had a change in government in between the act receiving royal assent and its intended entry into force but it is nevertheless a highly unusual event for a law to be adopted and then immediately paralyzed. A key factor here is the controversy surrounding the act, um, with its advocates arguing that it is absolutely essential to shoring up freedom of speech, which currently is under-delivered upon uh, in the university sector, um, they claim, and detractors, saying that the act is not fit for purpose and, and at times even calling into question what really the purpose of the act is. So what was the act designed to do? Under which circumstances was it developed? Are those circumstances germane to the functioning of the act? Um, would it support or rather undermine free speech in higher education? Is there a way to avoid cancelling the act? Which parts can and should be salvaged? All these are questions which we hope to explore this evening. And to this end, I am delighted to present to you our formidable panel, um, Aqua Reindorf KC, who is a barrister at Cloister Chambers and a senior fellow at LSE Law School. Uh, Aqua is an expert in employment, discrimination and human rights law. She's been instructed on a number of high profile, often polarizing cases in these fields. And among her many accomplishments, she was the recipient of the Chambers UK Bar Award Employment Junior of the Year in 2022 and the Legal Business Awards Barrister of the Year in 2023. And right next to Aqua is Professor Joe Phoenix, who is a professor of criminology at Reading University. And Joe's research spans a broad spectrum track tackling issues from sex gender sexuality and justice to criminological epistemology uh, joe was also a claimant in a landmark case for academic freedom in universities she successfully sued the open university for constructive dismissal following the harassment she suffered there on account of her research and then last, but by no means least, Simon Fanshaw OBE is Lord Rector of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he is also a writer, broadcaster, and diversity consultant. Um, he was one of the founding members of Stonewall, and he left the organization in 2019. He is currently on the board of Powerful Women and is chairman of, Hexagon Housing, of the Hexagon Housing Association. His latest book, The Power of Difference, was published in December 2021 and has won the accolade of the Chartered Institute Management Book of 2023. Very reasonably priced. <laughs> it's always good to have the details. No, no, okay, no, now, no. now before I turn over to this impressive panel who's <clears throat> chomping at the bit, I'll give you a little bit of information about the flow of the planned uh, discussion. Now, this event is both in person and online, and it is being recorded. Um, during the Q&A session, we will take questions from the floor um, and also check whether there are questions online. So online viewers, if you can please put your questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, and we're going to start with the three panel members offering <laughs> about the generous 10 minutes worth of reflections on HEFSA uh, and what it and its fate means for higher education. Um, and after these reflections, I will give each panel member the opportunity for a brief response to the observations made in the other presentations. And when this concludes, we will open the floor to discussions. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, so I'm going to be a stickler for time this evening. I brought my 
countdown sheets. I was already showed it to the panel. Two, one, zero. Um, and as we come closer to the zero, I'll also probably start, you know, you, those countdown sheets will be backed up with sort of wrapping up signals and, you know, maybe a little glaring and sort of, you know, quite mad gesticulating if it goes really badly over time. Um, okay, now for the Q&A session this evening, um, <laughs> I'm sure you all realize a university debate about a controversial measure on free speech. There could be opportunities here for irony on a scale that Alanis Morissette would uh, have approved of. Uh, but we're not going to let these opportunities come to fruition with apologies to Alanis. We're going to keep the debate vibrant and um, warm and multilaterally respectful. And will be helped here by the longstanding conventions that the LSE has in place for discussions. These are the following. If you want to make a contribution, please indicate by raising your hand. I'll be on the lookout. When you receive the mic, please do state your name and affiliation. Please focus your questions on the subject matter of this evening's discussion. Please be considerate of other people's opportunity to contribute. And in that vein, keep your questions as short as you can. Make sure that there is actually a question in there as well. And um, obviously, the, the equivalent goes for the audience members who are joining us online. OK, so thank you very much for your cooperation in this matter. And we'll now turn over to our first speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so, well, I'd first like to say this is my inaugural event as a visiting senior fellow. So I'm uh, honoured and delighted to be here um, in this very lovely building, um, making my first steps into academia. Um, I have actually spoken here before in this very building about a year ago, um, where I gave a lecture at the launch of the London um, University's Council for Academic Freedom, which um, was about, unsurprisingly, academic freedom. The title was Academic Freedom and Freedom from Harassment in universities. Uh, it was you know, deliberately quite bland title. I'm not an activist, so I don't do rabble rousing. Um, and the lecture itself is pretty dry stuff about the law. Um, but nonetheless, I was amazed and actually quite flattered that there were there was a protest in the lobby. Um, there were uh, there's a group of people, including a member of staff doing a teaching on the topic of hate speech. Uh, on the topic of hate speech, uh, and after the event, I was escorted out, out of the back doors by the security all the way up to Kingsway, which was a bit excessive, but still quite exciting and glamorous. Um, and then on Twitter, the person who had done the teaching um, described the launch, that Lucaf launch that we were we were celebrating, as a gender critical event under the guise of academic freedom. And he said that hate speech is neither academic nor about freedom and trans rights or human rights. Uh, to his credit, he later did take part in a debate with a professor here, Professor Lucinda Platt, um, about academic freedom. And from what I can work out, the discussion touched on that, that sort of core subject of what's the difference between academic freedom and hate speech. Um, <clears throat> and he talked about academics misusing their freedom by justifying and institutionalizing discrimination, personal bias and oppression by advocating for eugenics and so on. Uh, so I'm going to come back to that sort of framing, but I think that's really key to the question, to the <coughs> issue that we're here to discuss, which is the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act 2023. Uh, the Act was passed last year after very protracted parliamentary scrutiny, it went back and forth between the two um, Houses of Parliament. The substantive, as we've already heard, the substantive parts of the Act were due to come into force in August this year, and just 11 days before that, the government announced that it would pause those parts of the Act in order to consider options uh, more carefully, including possible repeal. Uh, that announcement was sort of slipped out as a bit of a footnote in a, in a briefing document. I think they thought it would go under the radar, but it didn't, and <laughs> there was quite a big reaction. Um, the move music now seems to be all about taking time to get the act right, but in the immediate aftermath, 
um, it, well, that was not mood music, and one of the, but, or an anonymous source, one assumes was a spad, um, described the act as the Tories' hate speech charter, which was just a staggeringly inept piece of political communication, but a useful clue, I think, to, about what it was, what it is at that core that troubles government about it. I mean, we don't know really what, what it is, but I, my view is that that's a, that's a very useful um, and before I talk about that, I just want to make clear it's really important to understand. A lot of you will know all of this at the back of your hand. Um, but HEFSA, this act, is not the first or only attempt to enshrine academic freedom principles in legislation. We have, and we still have, Section 43 of the Education Number no. 2 Act 1986, which already places an academic freedom operation on universities. Um, the trouble with that is that it's not really, it doesn't have a specific enforcement mechanism. The only way to enforce it is to bring judicial review, which is really out of reach for an average academic of modest income. You can try to weave an argument about academic freedom into, a, into an action in the Employment Tribunal under the Equality Act or even possibly the Employment Rights Act, but it's really complicated. Uh, and it won't be available in all factual scenarios. Uh, so, for instance, visiting speakers don't have any way of enforcing it through through the employment legislation. Um, there's also a possible argument. Well, the, the argument that is made in those cases is that uh, the academic freedom uh, comes within the protected beliefs in Section 10 of the Equality Act, and there's a case coming up in which it may well be argued, in fact, it is being argued by me, perhaps, <laughs> um, that a belief in academic freedom is itself a protected belief. So that brings everything around full circle. Um, uh, in addition to those sort of possible legal enforcement mechanisms, there's the un all universities have a, a, a commitment to academic freedom in their founding documents or their constitutions because they're required to do so by the Office for Students. It's a condition of registration and they can get in trouble for not meaningfully uh, ensuring that that right is secured in practice. Uh, and the Office for Students in turn has a statutory obligation to protect it, to promote academic freedom. And then freedom of speech more widely is covered by the Human Rights Act, which has uh, an effect on universities directly in their public functions and indirectly through all other legislation in their private relationships, such as with staff and students. Um, so there is um, quite a lot of law in this area. There's a great deal of law there, and it will stay there. It's not going anywhere, um, even though, I, know, I think this is probably true, most academics until recently have uh, probably rarely thought about it outside of Oxbridge. And I say Oxbridge because they have a particular issue over academic freedom, which is related to their retirement policies, which I don't think you want to hear about, because it's very, it's very dull. Um, but the reason I think why a lot of academics haven't thought about it much until recently is that it's never been very controversial. I mean, you know, if asked, nobody is going to say that they disagree with the idea that they should be free to question and test received wisdom and put forward new ideas and controversial or unpopular opinions without threat of the loss of their job or promotion of all privileges. There's nothing much not to like in that. Even the people who came to protest against my talk last year uh, on academic freedom didn't go so far as to argue that it was a bad thing in principle. And in fact, the person who did the teaching gave a defense of it on Twitter describing it as, a, as protecting the genuine pursuit of knowledge from interference from the powerful, but not using a platform to create or reinforce power structures like white supremacy or transphobia. And that's a very common type of framing. Um, and I think it's aligned to the government's position and the reasons why the government have uh, uh, brought back on HEFSA um, and their dis description of it as a hate speech charter. Um, and there has been talk of other reasons such as the impact of Chinese money on the universities, the Chinese regime not being particular fans of free speech, the idea that it's a burdensome act for universities and the idea that students' unions shouldn't be subjected to duties because that is the only genuinely new part of the act. But I actually think that the hate speech point is the crux of it. I think Simon's going to disagree with me. 
<laughs> argument about the act has two key premises. One is that there is no real problem with academic freedom in universities. Government has referred to that themselves. And the other is that academic freedom is being weaponized or used as a fig leaf for hate speech. Um, so first of all, is there a problem? I mean, it may be that I'm seeing things from the bad end because of the bad cases come to me, but I have a very strong impression that, that there is a problem with academic freedom in universities. And I actually don't think it can be seriously argued that there isn't when you look at some of the stories that we know about. You don't get to a position where what happened to Joe or what happened to Selena Todd or Kathleen Stock happens without there being really an entrenched culture of impunity for intolerance of, of heterodoxy or diversity of viewpoints. These are professors who have secure positions, considerable power and leverage. If that's happening to them, what is happening further down the line? It's perfectly obvious there's a chilling effect and that there are serious problems. Um, and also I seem to have been kept in work for the last three years. So when the lawyers are happy, <laughs> there is a problem, usually. Um, and that's the question of whether academic freedom is being used as a fig leaf. You know, on the one hand, we have people saying that there's an illiberal push to restrict viewpoint diversity. And on the other hand, we have people saying that those diverse views are themselves hateful and harmful. The gulf between those two viewpoints is, I think, to a certain extent, semantic. It's just about how do we identify and name speech which is academic on the one hand and speech which is hate speech on the other hand. Um, as it stands, the law gives us plenty of guidance for that. There's plenty of ample decisions from European law and domestic law, for instance, under Article 10 of the European Convention, which gives academic speech a very, very high level of protection. The speech doesn't have to be polite, kind, inoffensive, or even right or correct to qualify. And as I always say, always repeat, Lord Justice Sedley, uh, the Lord Justice said this dictum, obviously, the right to say only inoffensive things is not a right worth having. Um, and I, you know, I don't like using words like safetyism, ironically, because I don't like being associated with the sort of people who complain about it. But, um, you know, there is a way of looking at the world which prioritises the insulation of people's sensibilities from contact with uncomfortable ideas. Um, which is not going to sit happily with the idea that there is a freedom to offend. And if you're of the kind of mind that you would label Joe Phoenix as a person engaged in hate speech, then your threshold for hate speech is a very, very low one. And it is certainly not in the same semantic landscape as the law. Um, you're in an entirely different place. What you're complaining about there is heresy, not hate or harassment within the law. And the law doesn't, doesn't prohibit the yeah. law, that's very clear. So the law is on the side of pluralism and viewpoint diversity here. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> we have laws which restrict speech of various kinds, harassment, criminal law, so on. But the thresholds for those are high, and what amounts to unlawful or unequivocal <laughs> speech, poor Joe's public test infection, what amounts to unlawful or unequivocal <laughs> speech is all dependent on the context, and where the context is a university, the threshold will be even higher, because the whole point is, uh, of the endeavour in the university is rigorously interrogating the student wisdom, uh, so you have an extra high threshold. So the law is on the side of viewpoint diversity, but what it doesn't do at the moment is to, very well, is to give us viewpoint diversity in an easily workable package. That's what Heather was for. Um, it, it doesn't provide a clear decision-making framework for sorting the wheat from the chaff in terms of the difference between academic speech and hate speech. It's very, very messy. There are overlapping concepts of absolutely general freedom of speech, academic free speech, and academic freedom, three di different things, but overlapping things. There's all the law, Section 43, the Equality Act, Article 10, internal policies and procedures, and there's the Judicial Review, County Court, Employment Tribunal, and so on. And then there are the laws which circumscribe speech. It's almost impossible to navigate internally in the university. Um, <clears throat> and that's what HEPSA was for. As I say, HEPSA was supposed to fill it all together. There was nothing new in it apart from this obligation of student unions, just bundles it all up. 
Um, so, you know, against that background, <laughs> why people oppose it, who were on the side that would tend to think hate speech is uh, a lower threshold than it actually is. The protests, when I was here last time, they weren't really protests, it was if I'm teaching, but I like to think of it as a protest. Um, <laughs> they were demonstrating, it was Trans Day of Remembrance, and they were demonstrating for trans rights. Another really salient voice in this debate, particularly over HEFSA, has been the Union of Jewish Students and the Board of Deputies of British Jews, um, um, speaking really as one on this particular issue. And their position is that it's not dissimilar, actually, to what the um, protesters for trans rights were saying. These are the two totally hot button issues in <laughs> social media, politics, and universities, everywhere you go. Their position is that HEFSA will expose Jewish staff and students to even more anti Semitism on campus than they already face. Um, I just think, you know, given that it will result in no change in the actual law, I find it a position to understand, if anything, um, the reality is the reverse. It will empower marginalized voices, Jewish voices, and support supporters of Israel being obviously marginalized in, you know, in higher education contexts. Um, at the moment in the context of the war. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that's perfectly obvious, but my view is that there is another reason why people such as UJS and trans activists uh, want the law in this area to remain confused and misleading and confusing, um, which is that there is a really widespread problem <coughs> in institutions of EDI, equality, diversity and inclusion advice, and training given by external bodies, which are single interest groups. For instance, in these two hot button issues, we have Stonewall giving in, an enormous amount of guidance, advice, and training to institutions all over the country on sex and gender issues or on trans rights issues. And in anti Semitism training, we have um, the Community Security Trust who promote the IHRA definition of, of anti-Semitism and provide training on that and in that area. Now, these types of training, both, both Stonewall's uh, training and any training which is based on the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, almost by definition, will significantly overstate the effect of equality law in specific areas. Uh, I mean, and sometimes the people, not just those two, Oh Lord, I'm very <laughs> not just those two organizations, but many organizations will often recommend going beyond the law in these areas. But going beyond the law is actually going outside the law. And what happens often when you go outside the law is that you upset the balance of it and you end up discriminating against other people or breaching people's rights to freedom of expression. Um, and I, my view is that. There is an in, what HEFSA threatens to do is to expose bad EDI practice. Um, and EDI practice, which is heavily weighted in favor of particular interest groups. Uh, and I, I think that there, is a, there is a danger of exposure there, which um, is opposed for that reason. And I think that it is very much to the detriment of all because viewpoint diversity should not be the enemy of good EDI practice. It should be the central part of EDI practice. It is in the Equality Act. It is in freedom of speech is the, the most important human right. Um, freedom of belief is a human right. These things are all part of the same ecosystem, as I say, until I'm blue in the face, uh, and they should not be seen as separate to each other. People who seek to restrict freedom of speech because um, of it, single interest groups are not um, respecting the ecosystem, as it were. And I think it would be a terrible, terrible shame if the government goes down that road and continues on that path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akbar. Unless there are questions for clarification right now, we will first do all the presentations before we open up to the floor. So, Charlie, if I could ask you to. Yeah. Apologies for having to, to leave. Um, I have a cough. It's not COVID. I've tested a million times, and what I have is not contagious. So that's why I'm sitting next to him. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll try and get through all of this without coughing too much. Um, 
So I want to start a little bit uh, with a story about me. Um, I don't ever do these things in academic settings, but it seems uh, increasingly that I'm becoming or I'm being asked to speak not about anything I've written or researched, uh, but rather about all the various ways in which people have stopped me from speaking. Um, so <laughs> a bit of an irony there. Um, if you don't know, I was at the Open University. I was one of the academics who signed the original Kathleen Stock letter to The Guardian. I then signed the second letter. I spoke for an organization called WPUK. I signed those letters and spoke for WPUK because for 30 plus years I've done work around violence against women. And to me, the uh, policy that was being not implemented, but was live on the ground of placing transgender individuals um, who are male bodied in a female prison was wrong on all sorts of levels, uh, not least of which is that uh, many of the women who are in prison are some of the most vulnerable people that we have in society. But more than that, I also did not recognize how the regimes within female prisons would necessarily help uh, transgender women in the, the female estate. So that was what I believed. I made manifest, I think in the legal terms, my gender critical beliefs by signing those letters and by uh, talking to WPUK. Now I want to pause just a little bit there and say, there's a really difficult bit here for academics. And that's that the belief is protected, right? My gender critical beliefs, I believe sex is immutable, that from time to time, uh, it may be that sex is more important than gender identity in social and political organizational life. However, that belief also relates directly to the research I do. Um, it is impossible to separate me from that belief. Um, and that becomes a little bit interesting um, which, if I have time, I'll be able to talk to you a little bit about. But I also wanted to start this talk uh, recounting a tweet that I saw on Twitter today um, in response to a tweet that said this, quote, to give you a GC answer, I had no views either way on trans issues until recently. What started to pique me was reading about artists and writers, writers who had been cancelled almost overnight for expressing GC views. I found that unjust and scary. The reply that came from a professor of sociology um, at Sheffield University said, no one is cancelled for expressing GC views. People are told not to be hateful and exclusionary towards others. All right, so I'm just gonna pause there. I'm gonna give you yet another example. Uh, this quote uh, comes out of the Nicola Dandridge review. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may not have. The Dandridge Review was the review that was commissioned by the Open University following my tribunal uh, so that it could, quote unquote, learn the lessons of my tribunal. Um, and if you don't know, the tribunal was fairly robust in its findings. Fairly doing a lot of work there. Yeah, fairly is doing a lot of work there. So, this is a paragraph from uh, the Dandridge Review. Quote, they, and here Dandridge is referring to academics, they had thought that they were both acting lawfully and quote unquote, doing the right thing in upholding what they understood to be the OU's values in terms of support for its trans staff and students and a trans inclusive approach. For instance, in June, 2021, June, 2021, was shortly after the Reindorf report, shortly after the Forstadter EAT, and uh, just as myself and John Pike uh, launched the OUGCRN, the Open University Gender Critical Research Network. For instance, the June 21 open letter described at length in the tribunal judgment, I just wanna pause there because I like to, <laughs> um, described at length in the tribunal judgment, explicitly invoked the OU's gender identity policy and its statement on principles on academic freedom to justify its position. So uh, one of the things that Dandridge picked up on, and if you read the Dandridge report, there's something very, very, very sad about it. Um, in chapter two, there's quote after quote after quote of academics who are basically saying, don't know what academic freedom is, um, which is a terrible place to get to. 
So why do I want to start there? Um, academic freedom is in a perilous state in the UK at the moment. It is in crisis, regardless of what anybody says. If you can have a senior professor saying uh, what they said in that quote, and page after page of the evidence in the Dandridge Review, leave alone Kathleen Stark, leave alone Selena Todd, Rosa Freeman, myself, and all the other names that have hit the press. Um, it is in a perilous position. Um, uh, in my opinion, though, this crisis of academic freedom is actually a symptom of a wider problem and a different problem. And I don't think we should confuse the two. Uh, we have in academia an endemic culture of bullying. Uh, we have a sector where significant numbers of people working in universities don't actually know what academic freedom is. That's, that's pretty damning for a generation of academics. Um, where some of the most egregious forms of attempts to suppress academic freedom get farmed down and out to the HR departments in our universities. Uh, and we could say in the form of grievances. And where significant numbers of senior executives, and by that I mean VCs, both fail to understand their legal obligations and or have their eyes on in their view, more important matters than grievances between staff, because that's what happens when you have a battle about academic freedom and harassment that turns into just a grievance. Um, now, <coughs> uh, the Freedom of Speech uh, Act, the, he, ugh, thank you, uh, that <laughs> will not solve all the problems plaguing our universities, but it is a very important step that, if not implemented, I think will actively make the problem worse, right? We had a tiny glimmer where we might be able to get some sort of um, reprioritization of academic freedom organizationally. Um, but if the act goes unimplemented or canceled, then I think that tiny glimmer not only gets snuffed out, but actually, it will just make things worse. So uh, in late spring of 20, I'm going to hop around in time here, so just bear with me for a minute. In late spring of 2021, when the um, act, when the bill was introduced to Parliament, I'm going to say this, you may be surprised, I was against it. I was completely against it. Having spent many years in senior jobs in universities, I knew all too well the effects of managerialist audit culture for those of you who are academics, you'll recognize this, the TEF, the REF, the KEF. <laughs> um, that successive governments of every color have introduced, and I knew all too well, the confetti of paperwork demanded by such things and how that confetti of paperwork detracts from time spent teaching or researching, as well as being a phenomenal drain um, of resource on a university. So when um, the act was introduced, I was skeptical. Was it going to be yet another layer of bureaucratic audit strangling our universities. Would it produce any real change on the ground? Because that's what we're after, is change on the ground. Why was regulation coming via the Office for Students? I couldn't figure out that one either. Um, for it was then, and still remains my opinion, that audit governance has a deleterious effect on the quality of academic discourse. That's another story, though. Um, and a different one. Long before the bill was introduced, if I thought about academic freedom, I would have said to you that it's the ability to do research and for a university to operate without being politically influenced by the state, perhaps the church or the funders. And yet, even just before the bill was introduced, I knew things were getting bad uh, and that something was going horribly wrong. Um, after all, less than 18 months prior to that summer, so we're talking December 2019, I had been canceled from Essex uh, University. Did you cover that while I was coughing? <laughs> canceled from Essex University and indeed voted for blacklisting, right? So I got told that I was blacklisted. Then six months after that, my own OU colleagues canceled an academic conference that they were organizing on the grounds that one of the uh, co-organizers um, uh, was, in their view, transphobic. Um, and I was experiencing harassment in my own department 
Um, and by then, the summer of 2021, myself and a few other gender critical academics had already been likened to racist Holocaust deniers and supporters of trans genocide by our teaching union, UKU, or by our union. And of course, by then, the egregious treatment of academics like Kathleen Stocksley and Todd Rosa Freeman had already hit the headlines and campaigning groups like WPUK, Fair Play for Women, uh, Keep Prisons Single Sex were already in full swing. So I just want to say this, oh my goodness, two minutes left. <laughs> I better crack on. <laughs> I've never been dewy eyed. That's the whole point. I was never dewy eyed about academic freedom. Um, and I have consistently throughout the more than three decades of my academic uh, uh, career believed in universities. That's a thing. I have believed in universities and I have believed in academics. I believed that academics understood the rules of academic discourse. Uh, we use our words and our evidence and we make arguments that others might critique. I, I thought that that was what the game was about. And that when called upon senior managers would stand up and do the right thing. I suppose I still cling to these ideals, even though we're now looking at a quarter of a million pounds uh, of crowd justice fund that went to a four year long court case simply to prove the fact that actually being called a transphobe and having various open letters signed by up to 368 people to disaffiliate the research network is not proper academic conduct. And I will, I just want to, before I finish, rattle through a few things fairly quickly. So the problem that we have at the moment, the situation is in my mind as bad as it is. And if the universities, if our senior leaders could have sorted it out, they would have sorted it out, right? Simple as that. The fact that they haven't sorted it out means we need something like um, the act. Um, it won't solve all the problems, but it will solve a few. Um, secondly, the problem uh, that we're talking about is far bigger than events getting canceled or individuals being <laughs> harassed or discriminated against. The failure to support viewpoint diversity is hard baked into how universities operate at the moment, from ethics panels to grant um, to, to getting grants. Uh, uh, if you look at the details of the Athena Swan stuff, uh, I know somebody just had to <laughs> that expression, Athena Swan, to promotion criteria, to the bloating of EDI uh, departments in our universities, to the imposition of the politics of exclusion and rejection into our curricula, decolonizing the curriculum, gender affirmative language, or even policies that blindly accept pronoun policies. Thirdly, the laws on academic freedom and freedom of speech are complex and there is much confusion. And I believe that the woman sitting to my left earns a lot of money on that um, because they are <laughs> complex. And of course, they are complex. I sat in a court case for three weeks listening to it. It is complex. It's very difficult to say the line is right here because everything is so con contingent on the context. But one might be able to argue that social media pylons, petitions, targeted harassment campaigns are definitely way past the line. Um, and that is behavior that's not, not um, un, unfamiliar in our universities. Two more points and then I'll finish. Fourthly, universities are both special places and not special places. Why we think universities are any different from any other big organization always amazes me. And if we look at uh, uh, case after winning case of belief discrimination, what we are seeing is that leaders and managers within organizations suffer from what Ben Cooper referred to as institutional cowardice in the face of a bullish minority of employees hell bent on imposing viewpoint intolerance, <coughs> which in the academic context amounts to attempts to curtail free speech. Those case after winning cases, we're winning at something like an 83% rate. Um, that is highly unusual. Uh, normally, it's around 3%, 3 to 5% of belief discrimination cases win. 
Um, but these gender critical cases are winning left, right, and center. Um, so we need to pay attention to that. And as Aqua mentioned, external speakers are not covered. When I was canceled at Essex, and I often think about this, and I'm ending on this point, I often think about this. Had I not been canceled at Essex, my life might have turned out completely differently. If this act had been implemented in December of 2019, I might have had somewhere to go to to complain about the fact that I was in effect politically vetted and rejected and then blacklisted. But back in December 2019, I had nowhere to go to. I wrote to my head of department, I wrote to my head of school, I wrote to my dean, and I wrote to my vice chancellor. I told them what had happened. Nobody did anything. Not a single thing. No. So, I say, bring in the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act <laughs> <Yeah>. without delay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, uh, we're gonna move on time, and I'm going to make a quick executive decision here. Given as I'm being slightly liberal, more liberal uh, than intended with timing, we're going to dispense with the responses and go immediately to uh, questions from the floor right after the third presentation. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's a great honor. Um, you know, one does these things for free, and I'm a lot funnier when I'm paid. So, um, <laughs> but uh, and it's nice to be somewhere informal too, where there are no feedback forms. I did read just quite a lot. I was a pile of them at one recently, and I looked at them, and as somebody had written next door to my name, if I only had an hour left to live in my life, I'd want to listen to a speech by Simon Panchal. And, and I was terribly chuffed, and then there was an asker, and I turned to the continuation of the page which she had written because it would seem like eternity. So, I, I very much hope you don't feel like that when we get to the end of it. Um, I did a speech to UUK, which is the collective of vice chancellors. I'm not sure what you call the collective of vice chancellors, but it may be a cowardice of vice chancellors. And I was asked by the then president of the UK, Steve, who was the vice chancellor of UE, University of West England, a terrific person. He said, Go on, you know, really, you know, lay it out, give it to them. This is 2022. I gave them quite a, 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 you know, quite a strong view that the, A, there was an issue, and secondly, I agree with Burdock and, and, and Joe, that this issue was fermented, at least the process of the issue was actually a lot to do with this uh, devolution of responsibility to HR, to the way in which so-called EDI, DEI, EDIB, whatever you want to call them, policies, were operating within institutions. So people were hiding behind that. And I, I said that, and I said, you know, as an example, Stonewall, so I think you ought to think about the training you've got, you audit that sort of stuff. I'm so about you. And I was one of the six founders of Stonewall, so I'm a sad man. And um, I said, you know, you need to think about these things. I gave quite, I was quite jolly, but I gave him quite a hard speech about what I thought was the issue. When I sat down after it, not one single person came and spoke to me. I have never had that experience before. Not one single person. And then in the bar afterwards, people came up to me and they'd say things like, it was like I was selling pamphlets on a corner of a street in Moscow. It was quite peculiar. There were people who thought, a small number of people who said, yes, there's an issue. A larger number of people who said it's a conspiracy got up by the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph and it's a culture war snitch. And then there was a bunch of people obeying that five year olds just going, la, 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 please put my head in the sand. It was quite remarkable. One vice chancellor said to me, we don't have a problem with freedom of speech. He said, because our recruitment is still very good. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> so what I think is interesting is that partly actually around this issue of the cancellation of the act, but mainly because of Joe and others who, and Aqua's report on Essex and so on, I think there is a much wider acknowledgement of the fact that there is a problem. My job here today, I think, is to think about how we might try and make the act work. What is, what is the way in which we can convince this government that actually we should release the pause and make the act work? And in order to understand that, I don't disagree with you. I think that there is that, that, that there are elements of this government that have imbibed this idea of hate speech. I've never been in favour of hate speech. I've always felt that there's something different between words and actions. And the idea that words are actions 
seems to me to be a contradiction. I mean, the point about speech words is they're precisely not actions. If they were actions, every time you said the F word, you'd actually have an orgasm. <laughs> and our builder would never leave his house. You know, <laughs> they're not. Words are words and actions are actions. Now, there's a dotted line between them, but they do not in and of themselves cause harm. They may cause hurt, but they don't cause harm. So one of the things I think we've got to try and do in arguing about this is it's not the expression of the belief that's the question. It's the behaviour that follows from the expression of the belief that is at issue. And one of the things I often rely on and find really good, and if you haven't read it, I really recommend it to you, was the letter that Jenny S. Martinez, who was then Dean of Law School at Stanford, is now the Provost of Stanford, wrote in uh, May 2022, I think it was, and um, uh, a lecturer had been asked, uh, a judge had been asked to come and speak to, I think, the Constitution Society. So a bunch of Republican students had asked a Republican judge, and a bunch of kids turned up and they disrupted this. The university administrator turned up, and instead of saying, actually, what we're going to do is have a bit of a progress protest, and then we're going to get on with the lecture, she started berating the judge. So, you know, and Jenny Martin wrote this fantastic letter. Now, it's based in American law, and, you know, you will all love that um, because you're lawyers, but... The key distinction that she makes in it is the distinction between protest and disruption. Using a bullhorn in a room this size is disruption, using a bullhorn in a field is protest. She follows that argument through American precedent, but I think it really, really matters here. So the first thing I think we need to try and do is not allow this hair to start running that this is all about free speech, because people think that means you can say whatever you want. No one is arguing you can say whatever you want. Speech is in all sorts of ways, given parameters. We do it for porn, we do it for national security, we do it for all sorts of reasons, incitement and so on and so forth. Your lawyers will be able to recite them better than I. I'm merely a failed law student. We do limit freedom of speech. So no one's talking about people wandering around campus saying what they want. No one's talking about people coming onto campus and denying the Holocaust. That does not get you protection under Article 10, as I understand it. No new law there. What this does do, though, is it gives a mechanism, as Joe's just described, and this is where it is difficult to play this here at the LSE Law Department, but it gives you a mechanism that means you don't have to employ Aqua at the exorbitant and frankly exclusive rate that she will offer you in order to defend your case in a tribunal, which takes an enormous amount of time, and Peter Daly over there raking off his 20% as the satisfaction. <laughs> All this... What you will get out of the Hefsa or Hafosa or whatever you want to call it, what you get out of it is the complaint scheme. So you get compulsory registration, so you have to produce guidance and then you have to sign up to the complaint scheme. And what that does is it opens access to individuals within university communities to show once they've gone through the process internally in the university, and there needs to be some agreement about how long that may or may not take, and there's an argument about the number of days it should take. But once you've done that, You've then got access to a cheap, efficient, and relatively easy way of resolving your complaints. Now, one of the things I think it will do, and it won't be judicial, but it will start to build up, it seems to me, some parameters, some clarity, some guidance through the offices of the OFS, A, about what they will and won't consider, so vexatious complaints and non-vexatious complaints, but also start to build up some guidelines in dialogue with the sector about making them do it. And as you both said, the point about it is at the moment, they've got a duty to do something, i.e. defend academic freedom, but there's no enforcement mechanism. Now, one of the things I would say, and where I don't think the Act is particularly helpful, I'm not, I, I was not at the beginning that I was convinced, and I'm not convinced again, I'm not convinced of the tort. And the reason I'm not convinced, so there's a, there's a remedy in the Act which suggests that you'll then, there'll be a remedy in tort. I'm not convinced about it because I think what will happen is that universities will lawyer up at the beginning if they think there's that kind of penalty potentially at the end. And I think part of what we're trying to do, this is why it's difficult to say this in this context, part of what we're trying to do is de-lawyer this process. We're trying to get an enforcement mechanism. Now, the big question is whether or not you can legislate to try and get leaders to change culture. Well, the answer is you probably can't, but legislation has a role within it. And up to this point, they have... They have devolved and, and denied their responsibility for pursuing this in their institutions. So fundamentally what we're faced with is leadership. You're faced with a question of leadership. That's really what it comes down to. In fact, your vice chancellor at Reading, mm -hmm. and it was very good recently. I mean, when was it? It was, it was in 2022. Mm -hmm. He made a statement which was really clear about 
uh, about the exchange of views, the right, no right not to be insulted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then we've got to tackle this idea that speech in and of itself is a harm, because it, it, I mean, it isn't a harm, it's a hurt. And, you know, there are plenty of times I've been called all sorts of things under the sun about being gay. And you just, you know, OK, fine, it's not nice. And there we go. But interestingly, no one uses the N word in full these days, but they throw around the Q word with gay abandon, if I can excuse the pun. And actually, when I say to them, excuse me, I'd just like you to know that I experienced that as a microaggression. <laughs> they, they can't compute because apparently somebody's reclaimed it. Well, I haven't reclaimed it. I think it's offensive slur end of that's the kind of discussion which is fair to do and in fact i had it only the other day in edinburgh with the presidents of the students Union association and she said well i won't use it and i said i'm not in any way <coughs> seeking to please your language i'm asking you to think about the effect of your language but that's different you can do what you like that's up to you you can use language in the way that you like and you have to work those things through and sort them out so that's one, and that's one bundle of problems with it. And then you get down into the so-called EDI. We've just done a report called um, Flying Flags and, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, what is it? Ticking boxes. Thank you. Peter, Peter probably gave up the title. Ticking boxes and flying flags, what, where EDI went wrong and what leaders can do to fix it. Leaders can fix it. And one of the key things you realise in there is that leaders are increasingly saying from organisations, and there were some vice chancellors who contributed, they are saying that actually what we need to do with DEI, EDI, DEIB, whatever you want to call it, we need to return to the knitting. There are two fundamental purposes of equality, diversity and inclusion work, and, these are, and they are these. The first is to understand whether there's discrimination, how it works, and therefore how to get rid of it as far as you can in an organization. That's number one. So what you're doing is you're seeking to remove blocks to people's talent, whether that's as individuals or as individuals as part of groups. And that both of those blocks exist. They don't always operate because men and women, black and white, gay and straight. Sometimes there are different and complex reasons why those blocks of talent exist, but that's the first thing you've got to do. Do what I call solving the diversity deficit. And the second thing is once you've unleashed the talent, the point is to, to reap the diversity dividend. In universities, the way you get that is through viewpoint diversity. And that comes both from individual character, it also comes from the group you belong to and so on and so forth. It doesn't come from the enforced marriage of BAME, Black and Minority Ethnic. I don't know who that group is, but it's pretty big. It may describe experience on the basis of colour, but if you add Jews and Gypsies and Romanies, it doesn't even do that. So what are we describing in that category? <laughs> LGBTQIA+, I really have no idea who that is in that group. LGB, sex orientation, T, gender identity, Q, as I've already explained. Oh, I don't know why they're there in the first place. And plus, I mean, who's not involved in the group now? <laughs> I mean, I always say to people, they've turned a great passion of my life, which has left me in gay equality into a slightly secure password on the internet. But, but my point being is that this stuff is essentially performative diversions from the core purpose of these things. So that, that what we need to do is not abolish DEI, as is, is being argued in the States, we don't want to tear it down. What we're caught with here is we're caught with an anti-woke brigade and want to tear it down, and we're caught on the other side with the people who are handing them the wrecking ball because they're doing things that are so ridiculous. What we've got to do is plan this middle course. So what we need to say to the, to the government, I think, is A, there's a problem, and I think there's an increasing acknowledgement, although I think there may well be a difference between ministers within the ministry and the Secretary of State, but it's increasingly a recognition that there is a problem to be dealt with. Secondly, I think we need to emphasise the whole time, let's stop talking about free speech and let's talk about the behaviour that follows, because that's the problem. It's not the expression of the speech, it's the degree to which it stops other people doing things. Thirdly, this will be something which will broaden justice and fairness for a wider group of people without necessarily having to go through the extraordinary stress that uh, 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 Joe went through and the enormous personal enrichment that Acura goes through. <laughs> and, uh, but to essentially <laughs> makes the process lighter, more efficient, more, efficient, more accessible. I think those are arguments that will tell with the government. I don't think we should hang on to the tort. You may disagree about that, but I do think that unfortunately sets it back. And the last thing is that we do have to acknowledge that this is part of a bigger issue where people no longer say, I think I'm right, I think you're wrong. They say, I think I'm right, I think you're evil. Mm -hmm. And I recently just wrote the thing down, I'll just read it to you, but I, I realised that you can, you can uh, conjugate Twitter 
as an irregular verb. So it goes, I tweet, you block me, he says I'm a Nazi. <laughs> we cite facts, you demand I'm sacked, they say they're on the right side of history. And with that, we open the floor. Thank you very much. Oh, an answer to Simon. Um, a brief one. Only we, brief. Only we can afford your time. I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to be concerned about this because there's been repeated allusions to that now. But also, <laughs> I want to really make sure that that the gets its time in the sun as well. Sure, so okay. brief, brief. Okay, I just wanted to say I completely disagree that that there shouldn't be a talk. I think that without a talk, there's no enforcement mechanism. I think I mean I absolutely I absolutely think it's 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 material. I understand that, but but the danger is, isn't it, that it will that it will. I mean, and I am careful. I don't mean to take the piss out of this. I mean, I seriously, if it starts to you know equip the universities, they start to lawyer up, then the other then the person complaining is going to. I mean, that's the danger of it. I think. I mean, you have to have justice. Can I just add? Yeah. yeah. The universities have already lawyered up. Mm -hmm. I mean, God knows I spent two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, but what so my my argument is. Down. Yeah, but my argument is, if you have a, a freer and easier access complaint scheme, what you'll do is you'll you'll just provide more access to more people. But the danger is, I think, if there's a huge penalty at the end, then that might turn it back into what you had to go through. That's all. Okay, we're going to go to questions. Sir, maybe right. Many enthusiastic hands. If I could remind you, just if you could briefly give your affiliation and name, that would be great. Uh, my name's Emma Burns. I'm um, just an interested member of the public. Um, I went to see Joe in Canterbury, as it happens. <laughs> um, what do you think the chances are of actually unlocking this and getting this back, getting this onto the, um, uh, to become law? Uh, it, it feels like uh, it runs... To me, it feels like the government is so caught and so divided already that um, there's a, a risk that they're just trying to kind of please different constituencies all the time. And this might not be important enough. Um, the free speech might not count. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I mean, there's a, there's a number of things to, to talk about there. Firstly, there's a challenge in judicial review. Mm. Um, and by the Free Speech Union to the to the uh, forcing of the act and the potential repeal, which uh, you know they've got permission to to judicially review it, um, and I think you know that looks to me on the face of it like a pretty decent claim, and that but it, it may well at least put the wind up government. I think you're right. There's a lot of <coughs> um, tension within government about it. My impression that I've got, I haven't spoken. To Bridget Phillips and about it. I've had some contact with civil servants and governments about it. And yeah, I mean, uh, there's tension. I think the mood music has changed from the statements that have been made in Parliament, as I said, from getting rid of this hate speech charter to we're taking time to get, to get this right. Um, I think they've been surprised by the backlash. I think they thought, I think it was Maya that said to me that they thought, no, it was Helen. That, um, you know, because this yeah. act was, because Toby Young was involved in this act at the beginning, um, but any, you know, right-thinking person would object to it. Whereas, you know, now that they've had exposure to it, <laughs> one or two people who are outside their bubble, uh, they've realised that there may be some right-thinking people who are in favour of the free speech. <laughs> so I, I think there's, there is some chance, I think, Sorry. I don't think we'll, um, I don't think we'll save the whole area. <laughs> I don't think there are some, and I think it's really important when some to choose of this that <laughs> my bit that I would get rid of is the students union. I certainly wouldn't get rid of the torch. And I think there's a chance to raise some of it. I think, yeah. especially if the judicial review looks like something that and I think it depends on the balance of power, to be honest, between the university's minister and the secretary of state. I mean, that's that's where, because Jackie Smith. The minister went was in the House of Lords and very clearly said, "We think you know we acknowledge there's a problem." That is, a, as Dagmar says, that is a serious change in in rhetoric. And I think they, the difficulty with these things is always that people you know they pat themselves into a corner in a rhetorical flourish because they actually misjudge 
the temperature. They're also, they are concerned about the judicial review. I mean, I've had sure, a yeah. couple of meetings now and I get this. I definitely get the sense that make the act work properly is a good one. I'm not sure about the removal of the students' union. I mean, shouldn't students' unions be under some sort of pressure or do you think it's a, yeah, you think a resource question tells? Well, I think, I mean, I just think it's, it, yes, it should be ideally, but they are sure. <laughs> I mean, it, that's it's not what I've told in Edinburgh. I've told me I've fully grown up well, adults. Just about. Children. I mean, I have children of that age, and to my mind, they really are children. <laughs> but um, no, I think okay. that I would, I would ideally like them to be under a legal obligation, but I'd be prepared to wait until the sort of architecture is in place for them to be ready to to deal with it, because it is a lot of legal obligation for them. I'd be, I'd, I would be willing to see that go, and the, and the provisions about foreign funding, I'd be willing to kind of although let those go, although not, I mean, ideally not. But. You do remember, of course, you're, I mean, this is the very place that generated the Wolf Report, and uh, that was, as you will remember, on, on, on the Gaddafi Sun lecture and so on and so forth. And I've not criticised the institution because you instituted the Wolf Report, so, you know, you kind of tried to deal with it. But, I mean, it, it is an issue, I think, and it's, it, we saw it recently, although it doesn't cover Scotland, but, I mean, the influence of China is very strong. So, okay. you know, the leader of Edinburgh Council recently tried to yeah. do a friendly agreement with Taiwan, and the two organisations that came out against it were the Chamber of Commerce and the Edinburgh University, because they were nervous you know, of, of, of that. So I think there's something in transparency, but you may no, be right. China is a really big issue, and I think it is a real issue. Yeah. I do. But, yeah. We're going we're gonna to pick up another question. Thank you. Hi. Um, Patrick Sturgis, uh, Professor in the Department of Methodology here at LSE. Um, thank you. Really enjoyed your um, talks. Um, I'm, this is, I guess, a response to Joe's um, point about the kind of um, the, the curious lack of um, engagement with this in universities and a sort of comment on that, I guess, which is, I think, there's, there's, there's two parts to this. One is that um, I think it's not really that general a problem. I mean, if in, in, the, in the sense that if you're in the medical school, if you're, if you're in the chemistry department, the physics department, this just seems like a, 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 a weird debate to most of academics. So this is really a, a problem. It really is a problem in the humanities and the social sciences. So in terms of kind of what vice chancellors and, and so on, I think, Simon, you know, they're probably in, you know, many of them are engineers <laughs> and so on. So I think that's one of the problems that we face in convincing people this is a, a problem. Um, then within social sciences and humanities, you've got the people who, who have never been had this problem. You know, they, they've never really been told, don't say that. They've never been cancelled. Um, most of the people that you yourself you know people what's the saying a, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged you know until you've actually had that experience it's hard to understand what it's really like so even within the the sort of areas where it is an, a, an important difficult problem people are kind of just not so aware with of it and this is a long point but i'll, I'll, I'll make this brief the third thing is this the, the conflation of academic and free, uh, academic freedom freedom of speech with the right being on the right of politics and the far right and so on is used as a smear and we've had this here at, at LSE where we set up an academic freedom network was me immediately smeared um, by people saying this is all, these are all right wing nut jobs and then that of course any people who are thinking you know maybe this is a problem are, are very much put off that so I think those those would be my two comments on you know what what we need to address to kind of get the sector to, to understand the nature of the problem more uh, accurately. Joe, does that chime with your experience? Uh, yes and no. Um, I'm going to just slightly reinterpret what you said to me. <laughs> uh, you are correct. It isn't a uniform problem across every university, every department, every faculty. However, it is not just a problem of humanities and social sciences. We know people in the sciences who have had problems like this. I remember speaking to one person in Wales who was a, a neurophysicist or something like that. Neuro and, f <laughs> <laughs> and very science. Sure it wasn't just a Welsh word. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, it isn't just social sciences and the humanities. And even then, some of the social sciences are worse than other social sciences. Um, so I take your point. It's not even across everything. 
but I would not suggest to you that it's only in particular pockets. Um, that just doesn't chime uh, with the number of people who have contacted me, um, and I'm sure have contacted Sex Matters over the years. Um, so there's that, uh, and then I can't remember what else. Right I was wing, oh, politics, right wing. Yeah, yeah. no, that's that. I think was one of the 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 kind of best rhetorical captures that has happened um, is the idea that the only people who will defend free speech or academic freedom are so politically off the Richter scale um, that they're not even marginal. They are out there in the hinterland and should not be. Um, and I think that we need to start talking much more about that as academics, speaking as one academic to another academic. I can't think the last time that in a PhD program, we actually talk to students about what academic freedom is and what it is not. Um, and I think that we need to, in a sense, re-educate our sector, as in our, us as academics, um, into this without EDI, just actually start talking, what is it? I, on the politics, uh, it's really interesting because I mean, first of all, in LSE in particular, people need to know their history. Students mm -hmm. need to know their history. The Committee for Academic Freedom was founded here by Ralph Miliband in the 1960s mm -hmm. and some other, oh, then yeah, Noam Chomsky. I mean, really, we're not talking <laughs> Toby Young and David Rees Mock here. Um, so, you know, obviously, as we all know, this is the received wisdom. It used to be a left-wing thing, now it's a right-wing thing. It's because it's the people who feel like they're culturally sort of marginalised, who, who want to be able to speak. But I think further to that, there's another point, which is that the, the current sort of iteration of left-wing thought, what people call woke ideology, is particularly hostile to freedom of speech. It has at, it, at its heart a sort of um, anti-free speech sentiment because it's all about people's, or a lot of it is about, you know, hurty words and people's sense of identity being harmed and, you know, people being literally genocided by being misgendered and so on. So that's, that's a real difficulty which exacerbates the problem, but it comes from this sort of, this arriving thing comes from the fact that the right feel like they're on the back foot in the culture, not in politics necessarily, but in the culture, and certainly within universities. I mean, they plainly are within universities, they're not in general bastions of right-wing thought, whereas they were in, in the 60s when, when, the, when Ralph Miliband was mm. arguing for the right to protest. And it came from arguments for the right to protest, the, the sort of left-wing push for freedom of speech. But uh, it is a, a left-wing thing. And, and you know, um, the, in America, the, um, you, the ACLU, you know, they used to fight for the rights of the right to vote at least. They fought for the rights of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, you know, they wouldn't be in the same room with the gender critical feminists mm -hmm. because they've become so sucked into the sort of <coughs> anti viewpoint diversity. They've <coughs> actually lost their roots in, in what, what freedom of speech is about. A couple of short points. I mean, one is that I've always, I have this thing where I, the left always thinks it's right and the right never thinks it's wrong. We have a problem with kind of authoritarian views on both sides. But one thing I would say about the experience, I think you're absolutely, I think you're probably right. Broadly speaking, it's not something experienced day to day by everybody in academia. One of the things that's interesting, if you look at the Polish Studies Institute, KCL over the road, they've done some really good work on the state of academic freedom and freedom of speech within universities, and you get a really contradictory message. And the message is that large numbers of people think that academic freedom is defended at their university. Yeah. However, you see that, uh, and I jotted it down, that in uh, uh, um, that 60% will not say what they, meant, they mean or want to say if they feel that students will end up feeling unsafe, and 55% of them will not say what they mean or express their views if they think students feel threatened. So you've got these two things sitting side by side. They think academic freedom is being defended, but then there's this culture of threat and safety and all that. And what I always say to people, too, is that, you know, the point about safety is that, you know, safe space is a space that's safe for, is a space that's safe for disagreement, not from disagreement. The safety lies in the ability to disagree well. 
And somehow that's what we've got to get, get back to. But the, the policy study stuff is worth looking at because it really does identify that, that those contradictory things that, that you put your finger on. Um, thank you. There are more questions, um, but I just want to check with uh, Rebecca first whether we have any online questions. We have, okay. <laughs> Um, it's an anonymous one, and it's for ACO. Um, what difference does the FSU legal challenge make? Um, if the judicial review is successful, can the government not just then use their majority in Parliament to repeal? Can they use their majority in government yeah. if the FSU judicial review is yeah. successful? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm not able to answer that really in detail because I'm not that familiar with what would be with the challenge itself, and I'm not, I can't remember what it is they've asked for, given that repeal hasn't been announced um, at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line is the government ultimately will be able to do what they want because of their majority in <coughs> Parliament. If the, if the judicial review is successful, it, I suppose all it can do is, I think what, what they're challenging in the judicial review is the use of the very narrow power in the statutory instruments to cause it, and there's an argument that there wasn't power to cause it. If that's successful, it doesn't really give me very good in terms of an outcome, and certainly the court isn't going to be able to say you must bring this act into force forever and ever. It can't bind Parliament. So, you know, it'll be like a slap on the wrist. I think the value of the judicial review is more political than legal. Really. But I think it's a, it has a substantial value in that. It, you know, to that I hope something extent. happens before it ever gets anywhere, because yeah. I mean, it's a useful pressure point. But, I, yeah. but it would be unfortunate in a sense if the government was put in a position where there was yeah. Yeah. the FSU says yeah. you have to do this. Yeah. Back to the point you were just making before, they'll go, in which case we're not going to. So that's complicated politics. Then. Yes. I mean, the fact that it is the FSU is part of the politics. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we get Toby to change his name to Noam Chomsky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we had some, some more hands up. Um, yes, quite a few. Uh, can we go to the person with the grey jumper up there, please? Uh, hi, my name is John McGowan. I'm a clinical psychologist and academic, and I suppose I'm kind of approaching, well, there's probably a room full, full of lawyers here, and I'm approaching this only really with the tools of psychology in my head rather than, than law. And I suppose my question is is largely for you, Simon, though the others may have something to say about it. I'm struck. I'm fine. I'm sitting here really struggling with this idea between of making a distinction between speech and action because the, the emotional investment is so huge. And look what happened when suddenly the debate loosened up. Oh, the taffy was closing, or what? Are, do, do you know what I mean? Suddenly, um, you know, there were real consequences which you were if you're deeply invested in in an identity framing of feeling and experience, then suddenly there's a cost. I mean, it happens. We've had a little bit of hassle over, um, you know, not taking a position on the Middle East. But again, it's the same thing. You know, the emotion is just so strong that it can't be it can't be held. And oh, my God, you know, Israel are, you know, bombing Iran. And that's kind of your fault as, as well. You know, what I mean? so the, the fusion between, you know, the consequences of not absolutely scotching speech which to people is frightening is, is to them awful, I guess. One of the difficulties with this, I think, is that when you live in a culture where people claim there is no debate because that you are doubting my, denying my existence, etc, 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 the brutal truth of it is, is if they put up the, the case that there is no debate, then there is no conversation to be had with them. And the only tactic or strategy that you can then adopt is to start to build broad alliances of people who recognize it. So if you take, for instance, I had a fascinating conversation on Friday night with the deputy uh, manager of the pub that my friend Billy and I go to. Billy and I have been known each other since 1975. We're students and we go to this pub and we sit in the corner like Stapler and Waldorf and the Muppets. And we're surrounded by a variety of 24 Jews. And it's a safe space for queer people. And so it goes on. But actually, it's a really nice pub. And there was some Stonewall gin available. And I said, because I'd had a glass or two of wine, well, we're not having that because we don't approve of Stonewall any longer. Let's have some Tanqueray. The deputy manager overheard me, came round and was doing what she does. And I said, oh, by the way, I just want to explain why I said that. If you be interested, I'm not hostile to Stonewall, but I am at the moment. So, and she sat down, very obviously a trans woman. And 
we had an extraordinary conversation. And the dynamic of the conversation was fascinating because, and she said this, that so much of the response she said from trans people is based in their own trauma and distress. So she actually made that point and she talked about her own journey and so on and so forth, which was fascinating. What the point I was trying and did gently make to her was that you can't make public policy on individual cases. What you have to do is in that case, you have to reach some kind of epidemiological conclusion. And that's what you start to sell to the broader public because the bigger principle of this is not your distress, which I acknowledge and hear. It's not their distress or the parents' distress of the child. What it is, is how do we as a society, as an NHS, support young people who are in gender distress to make the best decision they can for the whole of their future life. So that's what we, so when we were in Stonewall, that's how we won those cases. We didn't sit around and say, you've got to love gays and have us in the army, and we've got to have sex everywhere we want. We didn't do that at all. We said, why are you excluding a group of people, apparently abstractly, from one of the great privileges of citizenship, which is defend our country? Now, once you start the bigger principle, so my point being is two things. One is that I am actually, in a funny way, anti the dialogue, because there are certain people with whom you cannot any longer have that dialogue. So if they won't have the dialogue, then they're kind of out of the picture in a way, and you have to isolate them and build the middle. Whereas what's happening at the moment is the exterior is trying to isolate the middle. So you're absolutely right. There's a ferocious uh, identification with this. And then by proxy, a number of other people getting massive amounts of social credit if somebody tells me they're an ally one more time, <laughs> you know, and I always feel when they say I'm an ally, I'm an ally that I'm being kind of pushed across a, you know, a, Belisha, a, a pedestrian crossing in a wheelchair by a burly heterosexual. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't need help, thank you very much. If you want to defend rights. So you have to take on these arguments, is my point. In the end, you have to be quite brave about it and say, you may feel strongly about that, but that is your individual point of view. We're making public policy. But that's a difficult political position to be in, and you have to be quite brave to take it on. So I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but always remember the bigger principle. We never asked to be approved of in Stonewall. We never said you must affirm us, you must prove us, you must morally think we're a good thing. We never argued that. We always said this is about equality. And that in the end won the day, because you can build a pretty big alliance around that. So that's that's my kind of approach and how I try and get there. Right, we're going to, I'm going to try and squeeze a couple more questions in, so we're going to have a go over there. Hello, my name's Peter. Um, one of the, I'm a solicitor, I'm not an academic. Um, one of the parties in the whole debate around academic freedom is the union. Uh, well, I was going to say the unions, but really it's UCU. And the leadership has been pretty awful. But I know that there are pockets around the country where the UCU has been incredibly constructive and helpful towards individual people. Um, the Secretary of State comes from a union background and she's, she's quite uh, close to the UCU, I think. Is the panel aware of any dialogue that's happening with the union? Is there any aspect of the UCU who might be open to a discussion around freedom of speech? Is any of that happening? Um, I sorry, I'll just jump in very quickly. Absolutely. I can't comment on that as I quit my UCU membership <laughs> after UCU sent around a petition against me. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, that's not the only time that's happened. I, I have not had any contact with or about them. I'm afraid to say, although I have looked at their materials on this and they're not encouraging um, at all. They were very much in favour of the pausing of the bill and to my mind they are in favour of the re of repeal of it. And they, they've adopted the reasoning of the Union of Jewish Students, um, which seems like a strange alliance given the other <laughs> issues that there have been. But, but there we are. Um, no, I'm afraid I haven't got anything of any anything reassuring to say about that. So I mean, if you got well, only uh, you were just looking at it there, just checking a, a couple of figures. There is the UCU did do a survey on academic freedom some time back, and that is quite useful in the sense that they do assert the importance of it, and there's quite a lot of 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 kind of data in there, and they will tell you that uh, you know they usually claim to be broadly in favour of it. So I think it's worth making the point to Bridget Phillipson in any way you can. As a trade unionist, you would want her and her the union to be able to defend people. You know that sort of line. I think is probably and that, you know if you could write her in those terms and maybe look at some of the things she's done 
in the past in relation to their own union membership. That might be a way of of just well, sort of... They did, of course, launch their own campaign for academic freedom a little while ago, yeah. last year, Yeah, yeah, over Israel-Palestine, when they felt um, that they were being... There, there were people who had been sacked from... Where was it? I can't remember. Some body oh, quite ago. No, yeah. Yeah, some EDI people who had been sacked for making pro-Palestine comments. And um, so the UCU, in co cohort with Owen Jones, try to launch a, 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 a <laughs> real academic freedom, they called it, but it didn't go very well, and in the end, I would just have to take down this little video, because he had like That would be lines. Camera, do you remember Camera, the campaign for real ale? Yeah. That would be... <laughs> <laughs> it was not, not successful, I have to say. Yeah. They, they were trying to draw a distinction between the, the academic yeah. freedom that they wanted, because, yeah. of, because they were expressing views for better freedom. And the freedom that I don't think other people should have because they were expressing views that they didn't agree with. Okay, we're gonna, gonna, I'm gonna get try it. and get to because I think there was one more question from the floor, and I would actually also like to squeeze in one more question of my own as well. So, um, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lucy Hanscom, I'm a lecturer at UCL. Um, something I've noticed increasingly, and I expect others of you have too, is as a kind of uh, feeling among students that we want you to tell us what's the right thing to think about this topic so we get good marks in our exams. Um, and people very rarely disagree with things I say in classes. Um, so I'm wondering, do we need to actually start teaching our students, perhaps particularly undergraduates, about freedom of speech and academic freedom and what it is? Like, you know, we teach academic integrity in induction courses. Do we actually need to start teaching academic freedom um, in induction okay. week um, so that everybody gets it? I'm going to type my question along to this because it's actually not uh, not unrelated as you mentioned earlier um, um, that there was that we were talking also about a failure of leadership mm -hmm. and it also well reminded me of the fact that well many universities in fact the, the if not the, the strong majority of universities at the moment in England at the very least are in a precarious position mm -hmm. and they are feeling very very vulnerable and they are, you know, the, the, there's the, the commodification, there is the fact that uh, the tuition fees have not held up with uh, inflation for ages now, and the prospects for this being resolved are, are you know, rather dim. And I was wondering whether that also, whether you think that is also a factor in complicating the landscape and in making it harder for uh, chancellors, etc., to actually kind of set out a robust stall and, and uh, come out leading on these Yeah, matters. I mean, I'm not convinced that the, chan the vice chancellors particularly want to. I'm sure there are some who do, but I do agree that the sort of general difficulty of the landscape financially, apart from anything else, is a factor. And, and also at the micro level for individual academics, the precarity of employment is a <laughs> very significant factor, I think. And in terms of um, whether people should be taught academic freedom. I mean, my view, having seen two children through primary and secondary school, is that we need to be teaching children that they can have opinions rather than just learn facts. I mean, that would be a start, because it, I was absolutely shocked seeing my kids go through school at the extent to which it was focused on learning facts, um, by contrast to how I was taught to think and then critique and criticise. Absolutely extraordinary, and right up through A-level. And I can only hope that at university there's still some emphasis on critical analysis. But I had a wonderful history teacher who's still around called Oliver Ramsbottom. And he is a, he's a great uh, global expert and practitioner in, in, in conflict resolution. And he told me something when I was 15 that I've never, ever forgotten. He said, what you need to do is you need to analyse facts. You need to be able to make an argument and you need to question the provenance of evidence. He used to say, who wrote the doomsday book? And what did they want you to know? And I've never forgotten this. It's such a great kind of yeah. way of thinking. But about it just that. doesn't. I mean, you know, it's extraordinary. But yes, teaching about because most lots of academics don't know anything about academic freedom. They don't but there is also this it. other emotional thing which I call cry bullying. And I mean, you know, there's a real difference. It seems to me to be to say we understand that students or whoever feel in a precarious situation. We understand that if you're gay or black or trans or straight white or whatever you are, you may be experiencing whatever it is that's, that you know, puts you in a vulnerable situation. <coughs> I get that. But to weaponize that emotion in such a way that you use it effectively to prevent challenge 
I mean, that is not a healthy way in which to live. And vice chancellors are peculiarly in unresponsive. That they don't know what to do about no, it. It's in my view, they're subject to commercial pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, also, but no, I also think there's something going on there about the the the, the primacy that's given to subjective experience but, now. But it's partly know. because students can go online and write their review and you know, yeah, pressure. I think I think there's there's like a couple of different things to pull out here. The vice chancellor's experience. Having sat on a senior executive of a university, the vice chancellor's experience of the university and the actual academics experience of the university couldn't be more different. Um, do we need to teach academic freedom? Yes, we really, really, really do. Um, but we used to teach it. We called it methodology. Right? We called it epistemology. We taught about what counts as knowledge and what doesn't count as knowledge. We need to reaffirm all of those things within our own discipline so that we know that saying things like uh, one might argue that gender critical feminism is fundamentally anti-trans. Well, you could make that argument, couldn't you? And you could rally different sources uh, to make that argument. But gender critical feminism is fundamentally anti-trans. Therefore, my university needs to disaffiliate this network. Right. Well, you've just gone beyond your evidence um, at that point. So, yes, yes, yes. Leadership, leadership is not just at the vice chancellor's level. Leadership is at the dean's level, it's at the head of school level, it's at the head of department level, it's at the head of research unit level, it's at the head of module level. Leadership exists from the beginning to the end of the universities. I, I know I sound, I'm gonna sound dewy-eyed here and I can't believe I'm about to say what I'm about to say. <laughs> I still believe in universities. Universities are an amazing organization where even though we're under the sort of pressures that we are under at the moment, and ne neoliberal governance particularly, even though we're under all of that, we also are the university and we can make these changes. We can make them in our departments and we can push them outwards. Um, and I'm just gonna end on that really positive note because you know, I think it's good. There's a beautiful I just, just want to you know clarify that I did not bribe Joe to end on such a <laughs> <laughs> Could not put it better. And if you don't mind, I think you know, as we are up on time, I think that's a wonderful note uh, to end on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.